I'm going to ask Bernd to join me on stage because he's going to run the second part of this presentation where we talk about all the other also cool stuff that has been going on under the hood. What do you have up your sleeve for us? Besides not doing anything yourself, but asking other yeah, people yeah, to yeah, present. Yeah. I'm so happy to have them with me. No, I think we have some cool topics to share. Um, there will be a highlight and or preview, um, and actually an early access version of the Nine Analytics Platform 5 that we'd like to uh, showcase some new extensions and integrations that we've been building in the past year. And I think we should also briefly summarize and show the Business Hub in action. Um, Data so apps. Data Other apps. data apps. Cool. Uh, that's why Iris was frowning all the time because Karen was showing the old AP, the so old I think analytics you need platform. To show it. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Take it from here. Thank you, Brent. Okie do. I need the clicker. Yeah, let's uh, start right in. The, uh, so this part of this uh, session will mostly concentrate on the software, on how we build the solutions that uh, Zeman and Karen and Michael also showed. So what's underneath it uh, show the platform how to build these solutions. Mike mentioned already, um, so first of all, it's not an intermezzo, but the NIME software session. We have the analytics platform, and we are going to concentrate on this uh, first. And um, the... The analytics platform, I guess everyone of us here has seen us used it. It's a tool that is underneath all of uh, what you've seen here and the engine of, of the whole NIME ecosystems. These workflows, reading in your data, getting all sorts of data sources connected, blending it in, uh, combining them, and then uh, producing either data apps, if Michael wants to have it, but just often also just um, output files or um, yeah, reports, whatever you, you wish. And um, the, these, these capabilities, these requirements of, these, uh, of, of such a data science platform, it's a platform, it's not a solution, yeah, it's, um, it spans a variety. It needs to be very broad. It needs to cover very uh, common use cases. And often it's as simple as reading a data, doing some filtering, grouping, et cetera, and writing an Excel file. Um, it needs to be integrative, reading, um, allowing you to access all sorts of different data sources and also tools. But it also needs to be very specific. So if uh, we see soon um, integration on molecular dynamics, I have no idea what it is, but this data science platform is going to support it. And we'd like to split this uh, presentation in, in actually three parts, but to start with the data science platform, the analytics platform, um, we are going, this clicker doesn't work. We are going to uh, start with um, an, uh, the, the NIME Analytics Platform 5. It's an early access version that we released uh, just last month. And we have Iris to actually do this because Iris can do this much better than I. Iris is working at NIME in a team that's called the data team. They analyze all sorts of data that we use internally user data, forum data, CO2 data, etc. And Iris is going to show us what AP5 looks like. Thank you, Bert. Yeah. Uh. Mm. And uh, the fun part is I also used to do a lot of trainings. And what we learned is um, while using NIME is awesome mm. because it's so flexible and so so many additional things to do. Sometimes the onboarding the first day is a little bit tough and we wanted to add more small tips and tricks and cheats and improve the usability to make this an easier onboarding challenge for the people. So this is why we started to re-implement our graphical user interface which will be released with the NIME version 5. As Bernd mentioned, there is already an early access version out since the beginning of this year. Um, you can download this from our website and use it right away. And we did this for getting feedback from you from the NIME community, which worked very, very well. We got tons of really, really good feedback. But if you feel anything is missing for you, uh, anything would be awesome to be added, let us know. We are around to just get any one of us. 
Uh, with this, um, you see here a screenshot. We will jump right into the demo of the Nine Melodics platform version 5. Oh, so here we are. Oh, there's already a new update in. So yes, also with 9.5, you can do updates and you will get notifications about this. On top, that's a, that's a default starting page. So you see some example workflows and you can, of course, also go now to your local space. As Michael said, uh, they built a lot of cool demos. So did we. This is actually one of the demo my team, the data team at NIME built. This was Marina and Marco. I can read it. You can mm. read this. <laughs> I'm good. <It's laughs> yes, this is because I used your screenshot. You know, <laughs> because there is now uh, also that's new with NIME 2. Uh, five, you can use control one, two, and three mm. to do zooming in and out. And this is control two, where you are putting the full uh, workflow to back. So this is a data app, and you, with the data app, you can already see some of the improvements and changes. So if I mouse over, I get my flow variable ports, I have a configuration possibility, and I can also directly open the visualization. The data, um, as the name of the app uh, is telling you, shows the CO2 data around the world. You here can see the sum of CO2 for the last years for different countries and how the different states go up and down. So Germany, somewhere in the middle, uh, China, United States are trying to get the first place. Um, what's also really nice about data apps, and so here we have a a map and a little bit more at the bottom. I can do some visual exploration. So I can say I'm only interested in so 2000 years and I would like to have this for Europe. But, well, let's take the European Union. And instead of having percentages, I take an absolute value. And then I can see that the last year it decreased by 300, uh, that's million tons of CO2 for the complete European Union. Not too bad. We are getting down. Um, so this was the data. We are now going to make a small workflow together. There is now a button for it, for creating a workflow. I can give it a name. And then I'm going to drop my data in. This is all like you're, you're getting uh, you're used to it. So I'm going to the folder in my Space Explorer, the CO2-based data, and I drag and drop. And by running the node, this is now right on top, I always get a preview of the data at the bottom. Um, what is really cool, and uh, this is all very new, so that's why I'm maybe too, too excited, is that you can now also in this view directly do, uh, do filtering. So I can say, what is the CO2 for 1980? And I can just type it here and it will filter down my table so I can do super quick exploration for live building of, the, of workflows. After this CSV reader, I want to split my data a little bit up. And for this, and for helping spreadsheet users to spreadsheet tasks, we added a handful of new nodes. And one of these nodes is called a table splitter. So if I'm typing split, you will notice there is now the cell splitter, the table splitter, and the line plot found. And you might notice that's a lot less than previous. This is because we introduced a selection of nodes for you. And this is the spreadsheet team. So you will only see nodes we are recommending for beginner users. Of course, if you want to see the rest, just click on the more advanced nodes and they will show up. Maybe if you search for less than me. Um, then I will take the table splitter and uh, tiny hack, you can now connect backwards. <laughs> the data, uh, by the way, the data still goes this way. <laughs> I, I like these things and I think everyone who built a huge workflow scrolls to one side to start connecting and going all the way back knows what I'm talking about. Mm. 
So this table splitter, uh, to go back to my story, is one of the nodes we made for make it easier for splitting tables in two portions. So what my use case is here, if I go back to my data, I only wanted to have the years after 1980. You see it's well sorted, so I'm just going to split at the 1980 year. So I can here select the year, equals 1980, um, and say I want to include this row in the bottom. The output table, it starts at 1980, and I can continue with more analytics. A uh, different way of adding nodes, so I did show you the space for the explorer, but you can also just connect from here and release it to see a list of recommended nodes. Um, this uh, the logic behind is still our workflow coach. So as Michael said, that's like a 60% solution of doing data science. The rest of the 40% you need to know on your own. But um, it's actually well prepared because I wanted to do, uh, uh, do some statistics on this data. For this, I typically would use the group by node. But we now made the group by node a little bit easier and made a second version of it calling row aggregator. The row aggregator is a simplified group by node. So I'm going to group by country. Just give me the maximum of all of the columns. Take the year and the population out, and also any of the unknown columns. Before you click OK, can you show some of the, uh, the help that the is what? offered, uh, the help menus, etc. Ah. So for instance, the aggregation columns or what, which there's a new weight column that is new and that is not available here. What Bernd uh, is asking about is inbuilt documentation. I, I don't know about you, but I ne re never read documentation. I love to try out. But from time to time, there are things which I just don't get what it's about. So we are now have inbuilt documentation. And if I mouse over, there's a question mark showing up. And you can just click on this question mark and get exactly the description for this specific option of the note. You can read it yourself later. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so one is a little bit boring. Let me get a little bit more data inside. So I have Europe. Let's add China and the US. And then, of course, I need to concatenate. That's still the same node. I just need to combine data. And this is also one of the small hacks. You might notice the pluses for adding ports, but I'm not going to use it. I just connect it. And by connecting on the plus, the ports get added. So that's very nice and sweet. It also always saves you a little bit of clicks. As I now have more data, I also would like to visualize it. So let me look at visualization nodes. And I get a brand new set of visualization nodes. If you are using 4.7, these are already published. Um, but we added more nodes. So the ones you might not know is the parallel coordinate node and the scatter matrix. I will just show a quick scatter plot. to show you how these new visualization nodes are working. So when I, whoever did build a visualization before, it's just super helpful to see a preview. Um, without a preview, you always go back to your data, see the data, and go then back to the view. And this is exactly what we did here. So you can choose the dimension. So let's take the year and the CO2, press save and execute and you have a nice preview of your data. You directly notice that the X scale is not working because it always, on default, uses a zero including. So let's add the domain bounds, and we get really a nice visualization. Another nice feature we added to these visualization nodes, you can find at the bottom. They can now also generate images for you. Let me run this, because these images and um, these are, I think these are some of the features where you will benefit a lot during your day-to-day -day work. You can see by just clicking on them directly in the node monitor as well. We can, of course, again, also remove them. And then also the port will disappear again. 
We also um, still can build data apps with the new graphical user interface with 9.5. So by right clicking or also by opening a frame and right click, I can choose create component. That always needs a small reset. And this, oops, this will be my data app. And that sends the same use case. I can execute it. I can open the visualization. And now, of course, I could also add a lot more different visualization and interaction parts. So that you did see once a real data app, I thought I would also quickly show you how a data app is looking when you have a little bit more insight. So let's go to the CO2 around the world, open the component, and use my favorite new, new shortcut, one two. This is how this data app looks in the inside. Um, if I could get my next slide. Perfect. If this was a little bit too fast, uh, as Michael announced this morning, we are also going to make workshops today. In the 9.5 workshop, or how it's called, the Hitchhiker's Guide, we will uh, especially focus on differences between 947 and 95. Yeah. So now my question. Bernd, what did I forget? I don't know. Peter will tell us later because he's <laughs> the product owner. He's also here. We have a lot of people from the uh, product and development uh, team here who are happy to also have uh, interactions with you in case you want to comment, have questions, etc. Just find us. The people from the NIME team have these yellow uh, lanyards, these yellow, these yellow tags. I don't know. I think you did great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And let's switch gears a bit. Let's look into not molecular dynamics, but look into some more advanced topics. And uh, for this, I'd like to uh, introduce Carsten. Carsten is a product owner for uh, certain parts of the NIME analytics platform, specifically the NIME, uh, the Python extensions, um, and also everything that relates to uh, data science and analytics. Uh, he's going to show some of the advanced capabilities, also a bit of enterprise flair, also because that's often users, customers want to see what's relevant for me in terms of getting my, my, my tool to work in my environment. Carsten. Yep, may I steal the clicker? Clicky. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me start with a very important not super specific. You saw on the graph that Bernd was showing before, the, we're on the specific side now, but this is not super specific yet, but really, really useful, the database uh, framework. If you haven't used it before, it's a set of nodes that allow you to connect to all kinds of databases and transfer tables back and forth between NIME and the database and also modify the, the tables inside the database system. And we've added a bunch of new nodes for that. The DB row manipulator and DB looping node allow you to write custom SQL queries, the DB concatenate and delete and data spec extractor nodes, they are more part of a visual query building where you click it together and we send this as a SQL query to the database system executed there. On top of that, we have improved the um, Oracle connector. It's easier to install and use now. We have added Kerberos authentication to many of the connectors and there's a new connection node, the Microsoft Azure service connection. Um, <laughs> One other system where you can connect to is Snowflake, and you can also use that with a database framework. What is new there is that um, you can have a machine learning model trained on your machine and then send that to Snowflake and have it predict on Snowflake so the data never has to go to your machine. That uh, makes a lot of the prediction much faster. And then, well, if you want to, you can still read the results, which we do here with the DB Reader, for instance. Um, there's more, like we've streamlined the call workflow nodes. That was very useful for the things that we saw in the CDDS presentation at the beginning. This, by the way, is key to it. The call workflow nodes and the ability to call out to other workflows. There are these nodes, Michael mentioned, the integrated deployments and the, the call workflow nodes. They have been largely revised. I personally feel attached to these nodes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really worth a, worth a try in, in 4.7. Sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you also saw Karen mention that uh, she has a REST API set up, and that was JSON-based. What we have added now is that you, we can also have a generic raw data container input and output table, so for more generic REST APIs. Mm, we have this column expressions node, which is a Swiss army knife, kind of the superset of string manipulation, math formula, and so on. This now supports multi-row uh, formula, which is really cool because then you can do sliding window, like custom weighted average computation, and so on. Um, and something that is dear to my heart, because I'm a Mac user, is we have finally a, a, a native build for Apple Silicon. So if you're running an M1 or M2 Mac, go use that specific nine build because it's just so much faster. Um, OK, I was talking about database connections and so on, so this was all about connectivity. But one other thing that makes Nine very versatile, that Michael already mentioned before, is extensibility. And that's actually where you guys come in. Um, assume in your company there's somebody very code savvy and has a favorite library that they want everybody to use for their data science projects. Um, and Ah, no. uh, and this, um, what you can do, what these people can do, is build a name extension. And name extension means they can take their library, put the, uh, build a set of name nodes, and then share that either inside your company with the finance team or so on. They can use this as any name node. So you only open the configuration dialog, change some things there, um, and run this. They never see code, even though the data engineering team has this coding library that they want to use. Um, you can also share these extensions via the hub, and then everybody can use it. That's really the beauty of the whole thing. And what you might spot already on the slide here is that I've written the pure Python nodes. You could do this with, um, with Java already for a long time, but as Python is now the uh, library in all of the data science world, you can now write uh, name nodes in Python completely. And to make that possible, we had to improve the Python integration quite a lot. Um, let me just very briefly recap on that. So there are a bunch of Python, uh, a bunch of scripting integrations. Python is one of them, Java snippet, R, and so on. Uh, for Python, we have added a lot of performance improvements there. Basically, we actually changed the way how Nine so saves data underneath, and then you can get this data into Python without copying or transforming, which makes it a lot faster. And the cool thing is you can even work with data that's larger than your RAM, because Python can just read parts of the table. Um, another highlight on the Python side is that we've improved the view node, where before it was only able to generate a static plot, an image, and now it's an interactive view, so it's an HTML-based whatever you have, maybe Plotly or something on the Python side. You can use that in the Python view node. And it can even um, communicate the selected data points between this view written in Python and the Java side, so all the other views in Lime. And with all of that, that helps us to, or helped us to allow you to write Lime extensions in Python. And what you see on the right-hand side, don't try to understand all of the code now. It's just to show you this is all of the boilerplate you need to write a Nime node. That's pretty much it. Um, it has configuration for input and output ports. It has a few parameters that will show up in the configuration dialog. And there's two methods that you need to implement. So this node doesn't do anything useful yet. But well, we have a Pythonic API to really interact easily with Nime. You can also access flow variables and report progress and so on. If you've ever tried to share some Python code with a colleague, you probably notice that it's not just the code that you need to share. You also need to tell your colleague which Python packages were installed, um, how to run this with py which Python version, and so on and so on. So to make this really easy, when you build a Nime extension in Python, we actually um, do the whole packaging for you. You just need to provide the list of packages that are needed, and then we'll take care of all of the management and install that on a user system, the user wouldn't even notice that this is actually running in Python. And with that, we were able to build a few nice extensions already. Or, well, this was not only built by us, joint collaboration with a team at Harvard. You might have heard of the geospatial analysis extension that was released um, half a year ago. And that has a lot of really cool new, now we're at the specific things. Uh, if you have the, the spatial data, then you can 
import these. You can do a lot of transformations, calculations on spatial data, and there's also a lot of cool visualizations, which I'll show you a little bit in a bit. And some other thing that is basically brand new, we've released it right now, is uh, the scikit-learn-based extension. Scikit-learn is uh, the most well-known machine learning toolkit in the Python world, and has really a lot of algorithms, not so much for deep learning, but let's call it shallow learning, so standard machine learning algorithms. Um, and now we have started making a few of those available on the Python uh, on the NIME side, the nodes that you see down there. But our plan is to make this a community effort to let you help us transfer, uh, transfer all of those algorithms, make them available as NIME node. And the other nice thing is because this is all prepared as nicely as possible, you can use that as a starting point if you want to develop your own extensions. So let me show you this quickly in a small demo. Would you switch? Perfect. Yep. So I want to show you these no new nodes. So uh, some of the SK Learn algorithms, as well as a geospatial view. Um, and I'm using the same data that Iris was showing before. So CO2 statistics, the uh, CO2 emissions from 1980 to 2020. And I also grabbed some other data um, from, like, a, what is it? Um, financial outlook database uh, about the gross domestic product of some countries, the population and the current bank account balance of those countries. And the cool thing there is that they have an outlook, so they also have some numbers for the upcoming years. And let's try to predict the CO2 emissions of the different countries based on that. So what I did is select the data up until 1980, 18, and trained a lasso regression learner, which we didn't have in line before, as far as I know, um, and well, used the GDP, the population, bank account, and we're trying to predict the CO2. You don't see any Python here, but it's using Python underneath. Yeah, exactly. You're not seeing <laughs> any Python. You're not supposed to see any Python. Yes. <laughs> um, and then we can, for, to check whether this actually makes sense, because we want to do some validation of our workflow, right, of our tra trained model, uh, pick data from 2019, where we do know the CO2 emissions. Then we can run our predictor as well, and then we can compare the prediction from the actual CO2 emissions in that year. And now we get one of those nice uh, views from the geospatial extension. Here we can see in blue the countries that did in reality emit less CO2 than our predictor predicted, and in red the ones who used up or no, who emitted way more CO2. So here China is unfortunately very red, and also Russian Federation, but the Western world, as Iris was showing, Europe is, has, has increased, uh, has decreased their CO2 emissions. So this might be plausible. The prediction was still pointing basically upwards, but the real emissions were less than that. But now let's go beyond, because we have data for it, predicted data for the features for 2025, we can compute an outlook and see how this will develop. So what I'm, what I'm showing here is a trend from 2020 to 2025. Um, and there it looks a little bit different. So for the Western countries, we will still increase our CO2 emissions, probably. And China and India will do that too. But the Russian and most African countries seem to reduce their CO2 emissions over the next five years. But take all of that with a grain of salt, because <laughs> this is really only a few data points and uh, only a prediction based on a forecast. So don't quote me at the climate conference for this. Prediction um, based on a forecast. That's yeah, a prediction based <laughs> on a forecast. <laughs> Can we go back to slides, please? Hmm. Um, these were not the only extensions that there are, um, but yep. Um, but there's already 
an extension built by the community that provides notes for notifications. There are partner extensions. The Redfield guys are, I saw them sitting somewhere there, um, developing, developing NLP and BERT nodes that use this whole infrastructure for sharing the Python environment um, when you install this extension. And we've built some things in house for here, for instance, for EC2 instance manage, uh, uh, management, and we're developing more. And now it's basically up to you. We have documentation for all of this. If we're doing this in Java or in Python, there will be a Python workshop tomorrow where we'll get a little bit into detail about how this works. And there are those two fine gentlemen that you can find at the birds of a feather table later today. Talk to them if you want to build or have ideas for extensions. That's perfect. And I'm happy that also showed the, uh, the nodes on the hub because the next part will be on the hub, but not the community hub, but the business hub, product that we released end of uh, last year. Um, and I'm going to hop right in and invite Megan here on stage, please, uh, to show some of what is available on hub. So taking these workflows, these solutions that you build and put them into uh, production on hub, maybe on a small scale or on a large scale, like what Simon and, and, um, uh, and Michael and co presented. Um, I think I leave it to you, Megan. <laughs> you won't. Yes, thank, mm -hmm. thank you, Vern. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, so we will go ahead and get right into it. So what is this commercial product that we have that's here to complement and just enhance all of the goodness that you've seen today from Iris, from Karsten, from Karen, Simon, within the NIME Analytics platform? And that is the NIME Business Hub. So just to kind of before we get into things, we know that a lot of you here, especially today in person at the conference, are very familiar with NIME. You might have used it for a really long time, but there's also a chance that some of us maybe aren't quite as familiar with NIME and might be new to the software. So to give just a very brief summary, NIME offers software that allows both individuals as well as organizations to make sense of their data. And we do that with our low-code NIME analytics platform, which is our open source tool that allows you to access, prepare, and create those analytical workflows on your local workspace. And then alongside of that, to complement that, we have the commercial offering, which is the NIME Business Hub. And if you've known NIME for a long time, you're probably thinking to yourself, no, that's, that's the NIME server. And previously, you would have been correct about that. So the NIME Business Hub is going to be replacing the NIME server going forward, and it's going to be what allows you to, within your organization, start to really deploy at scale what you've created with the NIME Analytics platform. So it's going to offer you additional functionalities around collaboration, automation, sharing insights, and data governance, and it's all done within a central and secure environment. So it really takes all of those great functionalities that we loved about the NIME server, and then we're going to add new functionalities that help to enhance the collaboration and the scalability of it with a cloud native architecture. So when we're talking about this concept of scaling citizen data science within an organization, um, the Nine Business Hub is going to be what allows you a single platform and a central environment where all of your data workers are able to collaborate. So it's going to allow whether you're a machine learning expert, maybe you're a traditional data science, you'll have that ability to reach out to all of your favorite existing libraries while still allowing an area for your business and domain experts to create their own insights from their data independently without relying on IT. And you're able to inject certain domain expertise and reuse solutions across personas within the organization. But what really allows for companies to start to scale this out is going to be that ability to take what you've created in the analytics platform and start to deploy it out to those end users to drive insights and decision making from. Be it a data application where users can go into that web-based interface and just get demands on the fly, or whether it's an API that runs behind the scenes, or maybe it's an automated report that's scheduled to go out to a variety of different users. And we'll kind of cover all of that a little bit more later. And it's all done within that central secure environment that IT has control over. 
Now, what about the Business Hub is going to help organizations start to spread this data understanding within their company? One of the things that we have really focused on with the Business Hub and spent a lot of effort around is going to be the ease of onboarding. So we saw that originally with the NIME Community Hub, where users are able to go into the hub, they can access a pre-built library of solutions or components that are readily available for, for them to get started with. So. The scariest thing when you're learning a new tool is that feeling when you open up the tool and it's just the blank canvas and it's staring you in the face. So the ease of onboarding with Hub is to help users get past that initial part of onboarding. And it's also going to allow for easy collaboration between users. So when we introduce the concept of teams and spaces, it's going to really enable users to start to collaborate both within their team and across teams in the organization. And once they have those workflows created, they've made whatever you know, task on their data they'd like to perform, it'll allow the users an easy way to deploy their workflows in a variety of different ways. And it really is built for scale. So one key difference between the Nime server and the Nime Business Hub is going to just be the architecture running behind it. And I won't go too deep into the architecture, but it's built on Kubernetes. It's cloud native, so it's really scalable and can be deployed to any number of users supporting any number of workflows with a single installation right off the bat. And alongside this, not to mention everything that we have going on with the Business Hub, but let's also keep in mind that the NIME Analytics platform is still open source and free, right? So it can really act as an adoption accelerator there where users are able to download NIME, they can get started on their own, and they really start to upskill themselves. And we've seen this a lot with just the open source community, and it applies the same way when you're using it within an organization. So it's easy to access, people can onboard quickly, and it can be supported at scale with a pretty low total cost of ownership over time. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over to the demonstration where we will get a chance to see the NIME Business Hub in action. So we're going to start here within the NIME Analytics platform. We know it, we love it, we've seen it many different times today from a variety of people. So I've built a workflow here, and this workflow takes data from different sources, and it basically aggregates the data, does some simple transformations, and puts it out into an Excel report. Now let's say that once I've built this workflow, I would like to upload it to the hub, and I want to be able to set it to run every day so that when I log in on my computer in the morning, I have the results from the workflow. So from here, I'm just going to go over to this Spaces icon, and you can see this is all within the new NIME UI. I'll go over here to the spaces. I'm going to find the workflow that I'd like to upload. I'll select the workflow, and then we're just going to quickly upload to Hub. And then from here, I will select the team that I'd like to upload it to, and then the space that I want to access it in. So after that, we will just select OK. And then we will go over to the Hub. So what you're seeing here, if you've known NIME for a while, is probably a very familiar interface to what you're used to. And it is really a combination of the NIME server and the NIME community hub. So we've taken that interface from the community hub that you're accustomed to. But what you have the ability to do here is really start to make it your own. So you're able to add your own branding. You can rename it. You can set how many workflows you'd like people to access, however many components. So you can really start to take it and make it your own. So what I want to do is I want to go find that workflow that I've just uploaded. So I'll go over here to my user. And for, for today's purposes, we'll pretend that I'm Simon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll go over here to the Center of Excellence team. Now, once I open the team, you'll see all of these spaces that I have within the team. And within the Nine Business Hub, spaces is kind of a new concept. So you have the ability to create either a public space or a private space. A private space is a space that's going to be locked down within the team based on permissions. So it's really held within an environment that maybe you don't want everybody to access it to. Let's pretend that in your organization you have, you know, data privy HR reports that maybe you don't want everyone in the company to see. So those are an example of what you might use in a private space. And a public space is something that you want to be more available for other people in the company to benefit from. 
And when I say a public space, one thing that I do want to clarify, just because I have seen a mm -hmm. few questions around this recently, a public space does not mean that it's open to the general public, right? So this is all still maintained and controlled within your company. So when we say public, it's just published within your own company. So people from other organizations aren't going to see what you put in a public space. So I'm going to go over to this Spring Summit 2023 private space that I've uploaded my workflow to. And you can see here that I have the workflow uploaded. And from here, I'm going to want to set it to run on a schedule. But before I do that, I want to capture the space as it is now before any other changes might be made to it. So with the Nine Business Hub, you're going to have the ability to create versions of your spaces. So before I create a deployment, let's go ahead and just create a version. And we're just going to call this version one. You could call it strawberry smoothies. You could call it Monday version. You could call it whatever you want. But for today, we'll just call it version one. So this has taken basically a snapshot of the space the way that it is now, so that if changes are ever made to the space from somebody else in my team, from myself, you'll always have a previous version that you can roll back to. Now, and, once I've and created, if I can chime in the 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 solution that uh, Simon and Megan and uh, Michael built and demonstrated uh, does certain operations that we are seeing here automatically. So, uh, creating these versions are done by a validation workflow. And these spaces that we are seeing here also, there are different spaces in that solution that are used for uh, for the production, for the validation, for the test, for the development, uh, depending on how far you want to go there. What we are seeing here is these, the, the manual step through, which is kind of this, the, what everyone is going to start with to explore the capabilities of the business hub, right? Right. Yes, and that's a great point. So a lot of this is automated with kind of that CDDS framework that yeah. Karen and Simon were showing. But if you're starting out with hub, this is kind of how you would go through those steps on your own. Yeah. Um, so now once I have the workflow open, I have it uploaded to the hub, I've created a version of my space, now I want to create a deployment. And with the Nine Business Hub, it's very simple. You really just come over here and then you select deploy. And as you can see, there's a variety of different ways that you can deploy your workflow. So if I wanted to create a data application like what Ira showed or what Karen and Simon had showed, you would do that here. If I wanted to schedule it on a schedule to run daily, you do that here. Or if maybe you wanted to expose it as an API endpoint for an external application to call out to, all of that is done r right here within the hub interface. And one new option that we've introduced is the idea of deploying a workflow as a trigger so that based on certain actions, that workflow will be set to execute. For this purpose, in our example today, I'm going to set this workflow to run on a schedule. So let's just call it schedule, Excel data aggregation daily. Now, what I want to do here is I want to set it to run each day. So we're going to set the initial execution context just for, for right now. We will repeat the execution every one day. I'm, I'm going to set it to never end. Sorry, whoever gets this um, workflow <laughs> sent to them. But we're going to set it to never end for now. And let's say that I would also like to be notified if anything were to go wrong with the workflow, if there were for some reason an error to happen. So I'll just put my email in. Oh, put, put Simon's email. <laughs> yes, yeah, Simon, would you like to get notifications? Um, yeah, so we'll say that I want to get an email upon failure of that workflow, and then I will go over here and create that deployment. So once I've created the deployment, you can even scroll down here for any workflow, and you'll be able to see all scheduled data apps, scheduled um, workflow executions, or REST API endpoints for that workflow. So hopefully that can give you an idea of how, as an individual, I'm able to take what I've built in the analytics platform, start to deploy it in the hub. But we also want to maybe work together across teams, right? So let's pretend, just for today's purposes, that I was a part of Karen's team, and I wanted to work on a workflow together with Karen within a space. I could come over here. I could go over to Karen's data science team. I would access the space that we're both a part of so that we can work on our workflows together. And I can come in here, find the workflow. We'll go to the training workflow that she was mentioning earlier. And then from here, I'm able to download the workflow so that we can kind of collaborate and start to work together. And there is still that concept of versioning so that if I'm to implement any changes with this workflow, it's still going to be captured the way that it was before. And you can always roll back to that previous version. 
So that kind of covers how you can use the Nine Business Hub to deploy workflows in individual and start to collaborate across teams. But how do we really start to enhance that ability for onboarding and start to help more users within the organization really get started and create their own insights from their data? And that's gonna be more focused around the concept that we've taken from the community hub where people can access those pre-built libraries of solutions or components that we want readily available to them. Example workflows that I'd like for people to have when they're getting started. You could also, for instance, use it as a search engine. I could even upload a lot of financial blueprints that they can get started with. They could log in, they could literally just search for finance. And then based on keyword, they would be able to find examples that they're able to take and start to use on their own as a getting started point. In addition to that, there's also the ability to share not just workflows, but components. So kind of what Karsten was mentioning earlier, for instance, if you had a pure Python node that you'd like everybody to have access to, it's really custom to your organization, you could have it exposed here as a component or as an extension that they can install and use on their own. So if I were an end user and I know that I want to start using AutoML into my Nine workspace, I could like it and save it for later, or I could download it and import it into my Nine workspace locally. So you kind of have all of those options. And the real goal there is just to help individuals within your organization get past that initial onboarding and start to share insights across your company, all in that business hub that's central to your environment. So with that, we can go back to the slides, please. So that can kind of help to give an understanding of how the Business Hub really helps to spread that data insight creation and understanding throughout your company. And what you can do with the Nine Business Hub that really allows you to scale is that you can give it to any number of users, and we've decentralized the approach to administration here so that IT can still set guardrails around your team, but you don't reach quite a bottleneck when it comes to deployment as we used to with that cloud native architecture. So teams are able to kind of manage their own resources here. So all that IT really has to do and is responsible for is creating the teams and allocating the number of seats within each team. And then from there, allocating the cores for each team so that let's say on a Monday morning, if everybody wants their workflows to run at the same time, you don't get those resources bogged down by everybody trying to access a central repository of them at once. Each team will have their own individual resources that they're able to access and execute from. And then once you administer that on the IT level, all that the teams really have to do is manage their own resources from there. So your team admins are able to determine who takes up the seats on those teams. And from there, they can manage their own spaces, their own deployments, and their own execution context so that it kind of alleviates some of that burden from IT when you deploy this at scale throughout an enterprise. So if I, if I was a didn't have an IT team, didn't even have a real large team, was, was just uh, my best buddy and I, and I wanted to get to start using this, what would I do? That's a really good question. Uh -huh. um, so we do understand that everybody is at different points in your journey, right? Maybe you have a smaller team, maybe you're not ready to deploy this at a huge enterprise scale and you're just getting started with Nime. We do also have plenty of offerings on the Nime Community Hub that offer you an area where you can really get started and just begin your journey there. So we have personal plans where these are free. You're able to have a space within the Nime Community Hub where you can upload your workflows so that if you switch from laptop to laptop, maybe you don't have to download, export each workflow every time. Or we have the idea of Nime Community Hub Teams where you can purchase a team space and you can start to upload and collaborate your workflows on there. Does it have execution? Like oh. data apps, rests, and Not yet. triggers? You should know, Bernd. Uh, You're working on that part. But for everybody else, you can kind of stay tuned on execution for Teams on Hub. 